بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So the Birmingham Mus'haf, uh, it's a Mus'haf that's hold, uh, housed at the University of Birmingham, and scholars dated, uh, did carbon dating on this Mus'haf, and they dated it to within a few decades after the passing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we're talking like 670 of the Common Era, just a few decades after the time of the Prophet والسلام, in the time of the Khulafa al-Rashidun, the beginning of the Umayyad period. Um, and this uh, started a lot of conversation. How do we know that the Quran is authentic? How do Muslims know that the Quran is authentic? What if, theoretically, one were to find a early Mus'haf that we could date to the same time period, but there's differences? in the verses, or surahs might be placed here or there, or something like that. What would that do to us? Does that change anything for us? Should it? What value does something like that have? So the question came up, and then Sheikh Talal had um, sought to put together this, pro this, this kind of uh, teaching, right? uh, a lecture telling the story of the Quran, from revelation to its compilation as a mushaf, and then how it's, compiled, how it's transmitted to us today. So Alhamdulillah, it's a great uh, honor to have someone like Sheikh Talal. I consider him one of my teachers. Many people in the Bay, uh, many of the Shiuch consider him one of their teachers too. I'm not one of the Sheikhs, but I definitely consider him one of my teachers. And so Alhamdulillah, it's, um, on top of the great slides he always produces, he always has good, you know, the content is always something to take home and to really build your faith off of, inshallah. So Alhamdulillah, I won't uh, waste any more of anyone's time. Well, with that set up, I'll pass the microphone, inshallah, to Sheikh Talal. Okay. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. It's a blessing and an honor to be here with you today. إن شاء الله the purpose of this talk is to share together and talk together about the story of the Quran. The story of the Quran from revelation to compilation and beyond up until our time. However, as you know, the Quran was communicated to us in two formats an oral format and a written format. Today we shall focus on the written format of the Quran and we'll touch a little bit on the oral format. The oral format can become its own talk. Can you all see the slides? All right. So the main question we're trying to address here, how did the oral and the written Quran reach us? With emphasis on the written format of the Quran. Uh, so usually when, um, when I presented this talk in Toronto, we went over three parts. First, we talked about the uh, history of compilation of the Quran. Uh, and part two, we made some comparisons with earlier scriptures, like the Bible. And number three, we looked at some manuscripts. Today we will take a look at part one only. So let's start by a definition of the Quran. The technical definition of the Quran, as the ulama um, recorded in their books, it is Kalamullah. The Quran is a speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sent down upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sent down upon his heart. Via the angel Jibreel. Jibreel is an angel, is the archangel that is responsible for revelation. That is responsible for communicating with prophets and messengers. The Quran is miraculous in its surahs. al bi aqsari suratin min. It's a challenge to mankind to produce even the smallest surah of the Qur'an. 
Its recital is worship. Reciting the Quran letter by letter is an act of worship and has been transmitted to us via a process called Tawatur, which is mass transmission in a way where error, it's inconceivable for people to have agreed on an error or on a mistake. And preserved in the Masahif, preserved in the, in the copies. We only have one Quran. But we have millions and millions of copies. Before we start, let's um, let's go over some slides where we show some copies of the Quran. Uh, for Muslims, we have about 250,000 manuscripts of the Quran since the early days. Much larger than any other book. This is a copy of the Quran that is kept in Egypt in the mosque of Imam Hussein that dates back to the first century. This is a part of Surah Al-Anbiya, and it's written without any dots, without any tashkil, any harakas, fatha dhamma and kasra. And Hamza is gonna make an attempt to read it. It took me two hours to read it. This is, uh, uh, an inscription on the wall of Masjid al-Aqsa, or the Dome of the Rock, on some of the walls, that dates back to around 70 to Hijri. And these are various, um, um, various verses or letters from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to others. The one on the top left is a verse dating from 80 Hijri, uh, written on a rock. The one below is also from the first Hijri, from Surah Al-Ahzab. These are various Mus'hafs that dates back to the second century, third century, and beyond. So today we hope to go over this, inshallah. We'll go over the history of the compilation of the Quran, and we'll take a look at the pre-Islamic time. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared the means and prepared the conditions and the environment for the Quranic revelation. Then we'll take a look of how the Quran was transmitted to us during the Prophet's time. Then after the passing away of the Prophet والسلام, we'll take a look at what happened during Abu Bakr's time, then during Osman's time, and then from Osman until our day. Before we start, can I get a show of hand? How many of you are in high school? Okay, great. How many in university? All right. How many parents? Lots of parents, mashallah. All right. Okay. Hmm. How many working professionals? Hmm. Good. We have a good mix of crowd, alhamdulillah. Hmm. How many doing homeschooling? Yes, we have to, mashallah. All right. So let's take a look at. Uh, uh, before Islam, let's take a look at the Arabic script. Uh, the Arabic script went over a lot of development. This is a script that is inscribed on the grave of a poet called Imru al Qais, uh, some 300 years before the Hijri time. And it's pretty hard to read. It's using a script from a tribe called Al Ambat near Jordan. Um, and if you know, if you've ever heard of the Petra, the same tribe that, uh, that used this font. But by the year 568, just before the Prophet uh, was born, uh, 
the font has improved a lot and the quality of the font and it's now more legible even today we can make out some of the few, le few letters in the font and by the year 620 or 630 when the Prophet ﷺ started sending letters to kings and to other people in everywhere uh, we can read the whole letter even today you and me can probably with uh, just by focusing a little bit we'll be able to read everything so it seems that when the Prophet ﷺ was about to be born uh, the conditions have been prepared that uh, the font is more mature and can be used now for recording revelations Another thing we see also in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> uh, prepared the conditions also in a different way. Uh, the jinn um, used to go to heaven and an eardrop on the angels. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the angels, we read, we read in Surah Al-Jinn, that these jinns that used to be the first astronauts, maybe, uh, they mentioned in Surah Al-Jinn that وَأَنَّا لَمَسْنَا السَّمَاءَ فَوَجَدْنَاهَا مُلِئَتْ حَرَسًا شَدِيدًا وَشُهُبًا We have sought to reach the heaven, but found it filled with powerful guards and burning flames. So the angels kept all of this as top secret. No one is allowed to find out about what's going to happen before it happens. During the Prophet's time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during the Prophet's time, the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam communicated the Quran to us in two ways. He communicated, communicated the Quran to us in an oral way as well as in a written way. So, the Prophet وسلم, whenever a passage of the Quran was revealed, the Prophet وسلم, would call some scribes to record it right away as soon as it was revealed. Whenever the Quran was revealed, the Prophet وسلم, would also deliver the Quran to the community, to the early Muslims, either personally, directly, or indirectly, immediately. So, <clears throat> The Prophet والسلام, as some of you might know, had many secretaries. In total, the ulama have recorded about, documented about 48 secretaries, doing, performing various functions and various roles for the Prophet During the Meccan time, Mecca was not known to be um, a community where people um, knew how to read and write. There weren't many amongst them that knew how to read and write. And the number of people that knew how to read and write were less than 50. But amongst the early Muslims in Mecca, there were around six people that knew how to read and write. And those six peoples, many of them became scribes. They used to record the Quran for the Prophet وسلم, when it was revealed. After Hijrah, the number of scribes increased and became in the tens, in the twenties, around 23 to 28 scribes. One of the most important scribe is a man by the name Zayd ibn Sabit. And Zayd ibn Sabit in Medina was a neighbor to the Prophet 
as well as many others who became scribes to record revelation. The Prophet والسلام, whenever, whenever a passage of the Quran was revealed, he would tell people, call the scribes. And usually whoever is available used to come and the Prophet والسلام, will dictate whatever was revealed to the scribes. Sometimes five people would come, sometimes seven, sometimes more, sometimes less. The Prophet ﷺ will call for Zayd, for example, will say, Ud'u Zaydan, call for Zayd, and let him bring the board, the ink pot, and the scapula bone. So Zayd would come with, with the board, with the ink pot, with a pen, and with either bones or palm tree leaves or sheet of woods or sheet of stone, you name it. And then would record whatever the Prophet ﷺ would dictate to him. So when something was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet would call someone from among the scribes immediately. And those who can write or used to write for him and he will tell them after the document what uh, what was revealed he will tell them place these verses in the chapter in which such and such is mentioned sometimes when a verse was revealed the Prophet will, will tell the scribes if only one verse was revealed he would say, place this verse in this chapter. And that was the way of the Prophet But the Prophet also set for us a process for authentication and documentation of the Holy Quran. And the process is the following. Sayyiduna Zayd radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet used to call for him. Whenever he goes to the Prophet والسلام, the Prophet would say, write down. And then he will write down the passage that was revealed at that moment. And then he will tell Zayd, Iqra alayya. read back to me what you have written down. And Zayd will say, فأقرأ عليه. And Zayd will say, I will read back to him. So after Zayd radiallahu anhu write everything, we have to do double checking. We have to do review. And Zayd will read back to the Prophet وسلم, whatever the Prophet dictated to him. فَإِنْ كَانَ فِيهِ سَقْطٌ أَقَامَهُ If ever I omitted a letter or a word, he would correct me. If ever there was a mistake, he would correct me. If not, he will say, أُخْرُجْ بِهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ The Prophet would tell Zayd, take this and deliver it to the people. So Zayd radiallahu anhu, or the scribes, whoever was present, would go out and they will start telling the people that revelation came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it was documented, it was written down, and then they would recite these verses to the Muslims. Sometimes, the Prophet ﷺ would recite the verses himself. And sometimes others would recite on his behalf. When the Prophet recites the verses himself, he is communicating the revelation to the people directly. When the Prophet ﷺ would ask others to recite on his behalf, he would be communicating the Quran to the people indirectly. And the ulama have recorded and documented 15 ways of communicating the Quran to the people. Nine direct ways and six indirect ways. So, the scribes, their job was to write the Quran in his presence. 
i.e. as soon as the Quran was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ would call for them and they would record it in his presence. Whatever was recorded in his presence is sacred, has a high value. If the scribe go out and somebody come to them and say, oh, I heard that there was a revelation. Can I copy what you have? Can I copy those verses? And a companion might copy those verses from Zaid. Those copies are not sacred. They don't have the same value as the copies that were written in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ in between his hands. And someone else may come to the other Sahabi and say, oh, I heard that you copied something from the scribes that they uh, recorded when the Prophet ﷺ received revelation. Can I copy it from you? And this can go on indefinitely, hypothetically. Hypothetically, it can go on indefinitely. But for us Muslims, only the copies that were recorded in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ have the value of revelation. Because the Prophet ﷺ is dictating, the scribes are recording, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching, Jibreel is watching. It is a moment of revelation. Anything copied from those uh, original and authenticated copy by the Prophet ﷺ are just copies. So the Prophet ﷺ would communicate the Quran to the people from his noble mouth to their ears, from his noble heart through his noble mouth to their ears to their heart. And they would commit it to memory. The Prophet ﷺ communicated the Quran to the people in many ways directly, i.e., either during prayers, he would recite the Quran. Or as soon as revelation comes, he would recite the Quran to the people and tell them, Unzila alayya kaza wa kaza wa kaza. Such and such was revealed to me, and then he would recite. Or he would recite the Quran during Jummah prayer. He would take a passage of the Quran, like Surat Qaf, and recite it and talk about it, comment on it. Nine direct ways that were documented. And six indirect ways. Sometimes the scribes will recite to others and teach others. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ will tell the general of the armies, when they go on a military expedition, he would tell them, recite the Quran to the people. And they would communicate the Quran to the people, to those who haven't heard it. So the companions, upon hearing the Quran, <coughs> they would try to memorize it. It goes into sh their short-term memory, and hopefully it goes into their long-term memories, and it stays there forever. And as we saw, alayhi salatu wasalam made sure there is always this Arad and Iqra, that he would read, and someone will read back to him. In this way, error is minimized. Actually, error is eliminated. No mistake. So in short, the Prophet ﷺ communicated the Quran to us both orally as well as in written format. The placement of ayahs was commanded by the Prophet ﷺ, the arrangement of surahs, 
was done by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what made everything easy is that usually the Quran is revealed five to ten verses at a time. Most of the Quran was revealed five to ten verses at a time. Very rarely, uh, larger than ten verses would be revealed. Surah Al-An'am was revealed all at once, 165 verses. Surah Yusuf was revealed all at once. But the first revelation was five verses, and then five verses, and then five verses, and then ten verses. In this way, it was, it was very, uh, it wasn't difficult to make sure that the recording of the verses is free of error. Because you're not dictating 600 pages at once, you're dictating five verses. And they can easily write it on a smaller piece of whatever is available, whether it's a, a piece of, uh, of, uh, of leather, whether it's a piece of wood, whether it's a, it's a bone, it can fit on those pieces. And it's easy to memorize. The companions would memorize it. Memorization is their strength. They memorized long poems without any difficulties. Memorizing five to ten verses can easily be done by the companions. So we started having Qura, we started having Hufaz. Not only that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would review the Qur'an every year. Jibreel Alayhi Salam would come down and they would, do, they would review the Qur'an together every year. I.e., whatever was revealed up to that year will be reviewed, was reviewed. And when we say it was reviewed, uh, It means that it was read twice because it was reviewed through a process called Ardun wa Ikra. Jibreel alayhi salam would recite everything that was, that was revealed up to that moment. Then the Prophet sallam would recite back everything that was revealed up to that moment. In the last year before the Prophet sallam passed away, the Quran was reviewed twice, i.e. it was read four times, twice by Jibreel and twice by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the order was reviewed from beginning to end, up to the moment of revelation of that year. In the last year, the Quran was almost revealed completely except for one or two verses that were revealed about uh, a few days before the Prophet ﷺ passed away. The other thing maybe we should mention, this process of uh, reading and then double reading back, double checking, uh, is a process that we do today automatically. But the Prophet Sallallahu made sure that the copyist or the scribes from day one, they weren't amateurs. They weren't people who don't know what they're doing. And they were also double-checked. Ibn al-Jazari has a manzuma and hadith in which he said, وَبَعْدَ أَنْ يَكْتُبَا فَلْيُقَابِلِي وَإِلَّا فَلْيَرْمِ فِي الْمَزَابِلِي 
After you write down, you double check. Otherwise, it has no value. Throw it in the garbage. And that's the process that was followed by the scholars in all disciplines. When you write a draft today, you do a spelling check. You review. You do version one, version two, version three. And if you, if you were to compare that to previous scriptures, that's something that the scholars of previous scriptures complain about. That many of the copyists have so many spelling mistakes that they were definitely not professionals. They were amateurs. And they didn't know what they were doing. So these, these are some of the ways that the passages of the Quran were documented, either on a bone or on a piece of leather or on a, a very thin uh, piece of wood or on leaves of palm day tree, whatever was available. There are a few names that we, we should be aware of because it will help us, inshallah, as we go through this presentation. Uh, many people play the role in uh, the compilation of the Quran. Definitely, the four Khalif played the role. Abu Bakr and Umar were the first to compile the Quran within one year of the prophets passing away, as we shall see. The Sayyiduna Osman and Sayyiduna Ali also did their, um, had their share. Uh, today we have 10 mutawatir qiraat that people recite in taraweeh. Abu Bakr and Omar did not teach the Quran themselves. Abu Bakr, his, his period as the head of state was only two years. And Sayyidun Omar was very busy. But they would assign Ubayy ibn Ka'ab, Zayd ibn Sabit, others to teach the Quran. Sayyidun Osman taught the Quran. And five of the ten qiraat go back to Sayyidun Osman. Five of the ten qiraat that you hear in Taraweeh they go back to Sayyiduna Osman. Another five go back to Sayyiduna Ali. Sayyiduna Ali taught the Quran. Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Mas'ud taught the Quran. I think it's a... Five of those recitations, also Qiraat, go back to Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Sayyiduna Abu Darda taught the Quran when he moved to Damascus as well. And one Qira'a goes back to him. If you follow the Sanad, it goes back to Abu Darda. His wife, Umm Darda, completed the Quran under her husband Abu Darda and memorized the whole Quran. Ubayy ibn Ka'b, the Prophet ﷺ says, أَقْرَأُهُمْ أُبَيْ The Prophet gave him a medal of honor that Ubay is top-notch in Quran. And eight or nine of the Qur'an goes back to Sayyiduna Ubay. I have to check whether it was eight or nine. Zayd ibn Sabit radiallahu anhu is one of the main scribes and four of the Qira'at goes back to him. There are also a few other people who it would be very useful to know about. 
uh, and those uh, have played a role in uh, in preserving the Quran for us today. One of them is called uh, Abu Abdurrahman al Sulami. Abu Abdurrahman al Sulami radiallahu anhu is a student of Imam Ali. He's also a student of Osman. He's also a student of Zaid. And he was one of the main reciters that was sent with the copy of the Mus'haf that Sayyidina Osman sent to the provinces. When Imam Ali wanted his children, Al Hassan and Al Hussein, to learn Quran, he sent them to Abu Abdul Rahman al Sulami. And Abu Abdul Rahman al Sulami taught Sayyiduna al Hassan and Sayyiduna al Hussein. Uh, the Quran and, and perfected their recitation. Abu Abdul Rahman Sulami initially was reading under Sayyiduna Osman. Sayyiduna Osman, when he became head of state, he became so busy that he delegated that function to Sayyiduna Zaid. So Abu Abdul Rahman al Sulami uh, read under Sayyiduna Zaid for around 12 years. And when Sayyiduna Zaid passed away and Sayyiduna Osman passed away, Abu Abdul Rahman al Sulami continued teaching up to the year that he passed away. Abu Abdul Rahman al Sulami died in the year 73 Hijri. Sayyidina Osman died in the year 35 Hijri. Sayyidina Zaid died in the year 45 Hijri, 45th Hijri. So from 45th until 73, he was teaching. Another guy who is also a student of Imam Ali, his name is Abu Aswad al Ali. He is credited by documenting or beginning the documentation of the science of grammar. And two of his students, two of his students, Nasr and Yahya, uh, they helped in putting the dots on the Mus'haf around the year 70, 80 Hijris. So in short, uh, when the Prophet وسلم, passed away, uh, uh, he left behind around over 120,000 companions, Muslims. Over 120,000 Muslims knew at least some surahs, at least, because they have to use it in their prayers. And thousands of Muslims knew Al Mufassal. The Prophet وسلم, it was his habit, it was his way that whenever he lead prayers, he will lead from Al Mufassal, which is Surah 50 up to Surah 114, 65 surahs. Those surahs are short. The prayer can be done and it won't be a burden on children or mothers or families. And he instructed his, uh, his companions to always shorten the prayer when they pray in Jama'ah. If they're praying on their own at night or making Qiyam layl or Tahajjud, you can read the longest surahs. But when we pray in Jama'ah, we make the Jama'ah short because people may be busy, may be sick, may have children, and so on and so forth. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, when, he, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, Ibn Abbas was 12, 13 years old. He said, 
He said that I memorized Al-Mufassal under the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 65 surahs. Those 65 surahs were memorized by tens of thousands of people. The longest surahs were memorized by, if you were to enter the Medina Mosque, the, Prophet, uh, the Prophet's Mosque in Medina, at the time of the Prophet, and you ask a question, who memorizes Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad? And everyone will raise their hand. Who memorizes Surah Al-Baqarah? Hundreds will raise their hand. Who memorizes Surah Al-Ali Imran? Hundreds will raise their hand. Who memorizes Surah Al-Nisa, Surah Al-Ma'idah, and so on and so forth. And there are those that memorize the whole Quran. They committed the whole Quran to long-term memory. And we have documentation that shows there might be others, uh, but the 23 people have been documented to have completed the memorization of the Quran. Around three women, and 20 men. Umud Darda was one of them, and she completed the memorization under her husband, Abu Darda. Other people that we will also see when we progress through the presentation is someone by the name Huzaifa ibn al Yaman. This companion, Huzaifa ibn al Yaman, was a visionary. He had a long-term vision. Many companions may have a short-term vision. Many people have short-term vision. Some people have long-term vision. Sayyiduna Huzaifa was one of those people. He had a long-term vision. And he used to say, people used to come and ask the Prophet وسلم, about good things. And I used to ask about evil things in order to avoid them. Sayyiduna Huzaifa would usually would ask about um, what if scenario. What if this thing happened? What if this thing happened? What if this thing happened? What if this thing happened to the Ummah? And the Prophet Sallallahu would, would tell him, would answer his questions. And over time, Sayyiduna Huzaifa became, became Amin al-Sir. The Prophet confided in him things. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam confided in him the names of the hypocrites. And he used to know the secret of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you have a friend, you may not tell him your secrets. But when someone becomes your best friend, uh, then maybe you start opening up and tell him some secrets. Sayyidina Hudayfa was like that. And he will play a major role later on during the time of Sayyidina Osman. Another person that is also of interest is a man by the name Khuzayma. He had an incident at the time of the Prophet والسلام, and the Prophet says, Man shahida lahu Khuzayma fahuwa hasbuh. Usually, you need two testimonies. You need two witnesses for things. But the Prophet ﷺ, because of that incident, he made the witness of Sayyidina Khuzayma equal to two witnesses. And it is his khususiyya. He's a special case. No one else can claim that.
Now we move to uh, phase three, which is the phase during our Becker's time. So if you can imagine now, the Prophet Sallam passed away, Abu Bakr became Khalifa. He was the first Khalifa after the Prophet When the Prophet passed away, the Quran was committed to memory in part by all Muslims, major parts by thousands of Muslims. The Quran in full by many Muslims. The Quran is written in fragments, five verses at a time, and they're scattered. They're scattered with the scribes. They're scattered with those that witnessed the revelation. And also, we might have copies that were copied from those that were written in front of the Prophet or even copies that were copied from those copies, and so on. And that's, that was the situation when the Prophet Sallallahu passed away. During Abu Bakr's time, uh, there were the Ridda Wars, the war of apostasy. And the Prophet Sallallahu uh, the, uh, the the Muslim army fought um, uh, those uh, uh, that refused to pay zakah. And during one of the battles, the Battle of Yamama, the Muslims suffered heavy casualties, especially amongst the Quran. 70 of the Quran, 70 of uh, those that memorized the Quran passed away, were martyred. And that was a wake-up call. Sayyidina Umar, when he saw this, he started thinking. And it was a wake-up call. So he went to Sayyidina Abu Bakr and told him that we should do something about um, the Quran and collect it all together. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr hesitated. How can we do something that the Prophet Sallallahu did not do himself? He said, Innahu wallahi khayr. By Allah, this is good. Sayyidina Umar also has a long-term vision. Uh, because when you write something on a piece of paper or piece of skin, piece of leather, a piece of stone, piece of wood, piece of palm tree. Over time, they may get lost. Over time, something may happen, they may get burned. Over time, um, the part of it may, may get destroyed. And if someone dies, it might also die with him or get lost with him. So he said, we should do something and collect the Qur'an in one place, and in one pieces. And they kept on discussing until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened their hearts to do it. So they embarked onto that project. So what did they do? Abu Bakr says, Umar kept on urging me to accept the proposal until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened my heart to it and I began to realize how good this idea is. Then they called for Sayyiduna Zaid. They called for Zaid. And Zaid came. And Zaid said, Abu Bakr told him, so Zayd ibn Sabit was, was tasked with collecting the Quranic pieces. So he put together a committee and this committee executed the task. 
and the outcome was the first collected copy of the Quran. And the project took about a year, one year, to complete. Then the, this first uh, copy of the Quran was kept with Abu Bakr until he passed away, then with Sayyidina Umar until he passed away, and then with Sayyida Hafsa, the sister of Sayyidina Umar, the wife of the Prophet وسلم, until something happened. When Sayyidina Zaid went to Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr gave him the task, uh, we have to ask ourselves a few questions here. When you start a project, whether in school or at work or anything you do in life, first question you ask is why? Why am I doing this project? What is the motivation behind it? And what is the process? The second question you might ask is how was the project decided on? Hmm? How did the company, or the school, or your teacher, or your parents told you, you have an assignment and you have to do this? They must have gone through some decision-making process and reached that conclusion that this project is worthy of being done. And then they came to you and said, uh, this team is going to put perform this function. The next question you might ask is, what kind of qualifications the committee members must have? We can't just bring, bring anyone on the street and tell him to do this project. They have to be qualified. They have to be good. They have to be committed. They have to see the seriousness of the project. They have to put their heart in it. If they don't, um, if you don't have passion in doing whatever you're doing, the outcome will be as good as the input. So the committee members had to have an appreciation of the seriousness of the mission. Also, when you do a project, we need an SOW. We need a statement of work. What is the mandate of the project? What am I tasked to do? When we do a project, we need a plan. Some projects uh, are private, some projects are for the public. And if it is for the public, then we need a public announcement. And we might also need a request for cooperation. Maybe you, some real estate developer wants to develop 5,000 houses in Tracy and they put a public notice. Those who don't like it, come, we're gonna have a discussion. So public announcement might be needed in some cases, and a request for cooperation might be needed. The committee needs to have an office. They need to have an address where the team can gather and execute the job. And then how the project was executed and implemented, uh, that also we have to take a look at. 
And then we need to do some critical and final reviews, make sure that there is double checking. It's not just we write something and we, we say it's finished. No, you have to review and review and review and review until you make sure that there is no error. And then you can send it out. So Sayyidina Zaid radiallahu anhu says, Abu Bakr and Umar and the companions told him, you are a wise young man. That's the first thing. Zaid ibn Sabit, is he qualified or is he not qualified? Is he qualified to lead that project or is he not qualified? So Abu Bakr told him three things. He said, you are a wise young man. First he told him, you are a young man. I.e. you are full of energy. You have a lot of passion. You're strong. We want someone who strong who can do the job and you're wise you have experience you have wisdom you used to write for the Prophet you used to write letters for him he used to translate Sayyiduna Zaid radiallahu anhu the Prophet requested him to learn Syriac and he learned Syriac in 15 days. And he also asked him to learn Hebrew. And he learned Hebrew in 17 days. And he started double checking the letters that used to come to the Prophet ﷺ in Hebrew and Syriac. He's wise. That's number one and number two. Number three, and he said, and we do not have any suspicion about you. You are credible. We don't have any suspicion about you. You're credible, your integrity, you have integrity, you have good conduct. No one doubt you. We cannot give a project to someone that we doubt. And number four, he said, and you used to write the divine inspiration, revelation to, for the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number four, you have experience. It's not, that, it's not just that you have energy and you're wise and, and you have integrity. No, also you have experience. You've done that before. That's not the first time. It's not just you've done it before, you've done it so many times that you are the best person to carry this, this work. And then Sayyidina Abu Bakr and those with him told him, this is your task, this is your mission. This is your SOW. So search for the fragmentary scripts of the Quran and compile them together into one book. The project is well identified. Very simple. Search, bring them together, compile them into one book. Now, Zaid is qualified. Now we have to select the committee. We have to make sure that the members of the committee appreciate the seriousness of the, of the project. So Zaid radiallahu anhu says, by Allah, if they had ordered me to move one of the mountains, it would not have been heavier for me than this. I order him to compile the Quran is a heavy responsibility. And he felt the seriousness of that that responsibility. 
Then later on, Sayyidina Zayd in the same hadith said, therefore I started looking for the Quran and collecting it from what it was written on, palm stalks, thin white stones, and so on and so forth. The committee members that were chosen for this the committee members that were chosen for this task were Sayyidina Zaid he was the project manager. Sayyiduna Ubay ibn Ka'b, who is Aqra'uhum, and Sayyiduna Umar. Sayyiduna Umar played the marketing role. Sayyiduna Umar made the public announcement. and chose the address. And the committee had an office, as you might have guessed, outside the gate of the mosque of the Prophet So at the gate, that was their office. The three people used to stand there. Whoever comes, whoever goes to pray, they would ask him. public announcement and request for cooperation. They would ask him. And the work was divided as follow. Sayyiduna Ubayy ibn Ka'b would recite, because his recitation is immaculate. And Sayyiduna Zaid will write. And then they would review back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But first, we have to find all those uh, fragments. So they made the public announcements and they followed uh, a methodology. And the methodology is, the Quran is committed to memory by Sayyiduna Zaid, by Sayyiduna Umar, by Ubay ibn Ka'b. So we know the Quran by memory. Now we want pieces. But we don't want any pieces. We only want the pieces that were written in front of the Prophet ﷺ. Only those pieces. Any other piece that was written from those written in front of the Prophet ﷺ, we don't want those. So Sayyidina Zaid, um, his methodology was that He must be written, it must be written in the presence of the Prophet. He said, He said, Bring to me whatever was written in between his hands, in between the hands of the Prophet. And number two, at least two witnesses that witnessed that event. And they collected the script, the, the fragments, using that methodology. All of the fragments. So it took, yes? Right. More actually, yeah, yes. They went, but um, whenever something was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ would call whoever was available from the scribes. Now the scribes, they were not just six, huh? The number of scribes at one time, whatever, 
whoever comes, sometimes they're two, sometimes they're three, sometimes they're seven, sometimes they're five, sometimes they're 13. Yeah, because the number of scribes, as I, um, from what we know, I, I don't recall the exact numbers, it's either 23 or 43 scribes. Huh? And some people also go away, or maybe uh, that piece, he left it with his brother or his whoever, you know? So what is more, what is, um, what they wanted to do is that whoever presents that piece and claims that it is written in the front of Allah, we need two witnesses, the scribe and someone else. The one that wrote it and someone else. And that's what they did. That's a very good question. Jazakallah khair. So then when the first collected uh, copy of the Mus'haf was written, uh, it was preserved with Sayyidina Abu Bakr, then with Sayyidina Umar, and then with Sayyidina Hafsa, with uh, Sayyidina Hafsa. So nothing of um, uh, worthy of notice took place when Sayyidina Umar was in charge of the Khilafah. He was a Khalifa for about 10 years. Um, and Sayyidina Umar had a policy. Policy is uh, the... Um, um, the companions should not leave Medina. He needed the companions uh, to stay in Medina uh, to advise him and consultation and so on and so forth. So during the time of Sayyidina Umar, most of the companions that were in Medina stayed in Medina. Only few uh, were sent abroad. The Sayyidina Abdullah Mas'ud was sent to Kufa on a mission by Sayyidina Umar. And very few people were also sent on missions. When, uh, when Iraq was opened, when Iraq became Muslim, Sayyidina Abdullah Mas'ud was sent to help in the transition. Iraq is not like Medina. Iraq is a civilization. Thousands of years of civilization. Uh, Medina is a civilization, but it's a simple civilization compared to Iraq, where you had uh, various religions, various cultures, various ethnicity, various people occupying over thousands of years. So Sayyidina Umar sent Abdullah ibn Mas'ud to help in that transition. Because when you have a new country like Iraq and they want to align everything with the Islamic teachings, it takes someone who's an expert to do it. It can't be just someone like you and me. So Sayyidina Umar sent Abdullah in Mas'ud. Uh, imagine, for example, if the US or Canada were to become Muslim and you want to change everything from the political system to the socio-economic system to everything to be aligned with the teachings of Islam, it takes a huge team to do it. It takes people who have encyclopedic knowledge, not just someone who knows a little bit here and there. So Sayyidina Umar sent Abdullah Mas'ud and sent someone with him. Abdullah Mas'ud began by assessing the situation in Iraq, and then he started an academy. And in the academy there were 10 students. 
Later on, the 10 students became 100. Later on, the 100 students became 4,000. Abdullah Masoud and 4,000 students changed all of Iraq in a very short period of time. And he taught them the Quran and how to understand it and how to apply it. So Sayyidina Umar during his time, uh, few companions went abroad and there was no need for them to go abroad. But during the, the time of Sayyidina Osman, things have changed. Things have changed that uh, many countries have now become Muslim. And they needed to learn their religion. So the companions started leaving Medina and going to Syria, going to Iraq, going to wherever it takes them. And they started teaching the people their religion. The Muslim army was advancing near uh, the Caspian Sea, near Georgia and Uzbekistan and Armenia and Azerbaijan. And in the battle there, the army from Iraq and the army from Syria met. And with them was Sayyiduna Huzaifa ibn al-Yaman, Aminu Sirri Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The one that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa confided in him, the names of the hypocrites, and the one that used to ask the Prophet about uh, the bad things that could occur after his death. So when the Muslim army, when the Iraqi and Syrian army met in Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, Huzaifa ibn al-Yaman witnessed something between um, uh, between the two armies that alarmed him. And his reaction, because he saw people reciting the Quran, and he saw another group reciting the Quran, or two men, or two groups, and they were calling each other wrong in recitation. So it alarmed him so much to the point that he left the battlefield and went straight to Medina to Sayyidina Osman. And he told him, Adrik hazil ummah. Take charge of this ummah. Hurry and do something about this ummah before they differ among themselves, like the people of the earlier scriptures, uh, the the Jews and the Christians differed among themselves. Then Sayyidina Osman radiallahu anhu took an initiative to start a new project. The new project is to take the master copy that was kept, that was prepared by Sayyiduna Abu Bakr, and to make five to seven master copies and send them abroad to various urban areas, to the provinces, to the Amsar, to the main cities in each province. And with each copy, with each master copy, he would send also a master reciter. And told the people that whatever you have, you compare it against this master copy. This is your frame of reference. Whatever agrees with it, you take it. Whatever doesn't agree with it, you burn it. Those are the master copies. So now we have to ask some questions. Number one, what did 
Huzaifa radiyallahu anhu what did he witness? What did he see? What alarmed him? What made him so upset? Number two, why did he leave Armenia and Azerbaijan? Uh, is it easy to leave Armenia and Azerbaijan? Is it okay to leave Armenia and Azerbaijan? Does he have the right to leave Armenia and Azerbaijan? Is it up to him to leave Armenia and Azerbaijan? Because leaving the battlefield is not allowed. Deserting an army is not allowed. In today's standards, you could be court-martialed. In Islam, it's a major sin. It's kabira to min al-kabair. Yet, Sayyidina Huzaifa left the battlefield and went straight to Sayyidina Osman in Medina. So the harm, <coughs> he must have seen a greater harm, greater evil that uh, must be corrected and leaving Armenia and Azerbaijan was a lesser evil. Number three, what do you think was Osman's reaction? You have somebody leaving the army and coming and telling you take charge of this ummah, do something about it before, before they differ among themselves. How do you think Sayyidina Osman tackled the issue? What was the issue? And what solution did Sayyidina Osman adopt and why? Uh, today we will not go over the oral uh, oral format of the of the Quran and the Qur'at and recitations, but we'll have to touch a little bit on it. Uh, so let's start by taking a look at dialects, Arabic dialects. Now I'm sitting. No, no, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you. But before we go into that, we have to take a step back and let's go back to the Arabs before Islam. All right? So let me ask you a question. Did, uh, like we know the Arabic uh, before Islam is pure Arabic. There is no mistakes. We measure our Arabic by their Arabic. They are the frame of reference. Uh, and they were excellent in poetry, excellent in rhetoric. Uh, that was their strength, language. Question is, do you think all Arabs spoke the same Arabic or Fusha Arabic at the time? Like we have tribes, about 50 tribes. Uh, at the time of the Prophet there were about over 50 tribes. The tribe of uh, Banu Tamim, Watafan, Aqif, Azit Shanu'a, Quraysh, which is in Mecca, Al Ambat, near Jordan. Banu Hanifa, Banu Daws in Yemen, Awsan Khazraj in Medina, Himyar, and many others. But did all these tribes 
speak the same Arabic or Fusha Arabic or classical Arabic? Because we know in the Qiraat, all Qiraat are Fusha Arabic. But not all Arabic is allowed in Qiraat. Not all Arabic from any tribes is allowed in Qiraat in terms of how they pronounce things and how they say things. But the answer is actually that all Arabian tribes spoke Arabic with variants. Variants that specific to their tribe. So when we talk about the language, we're talking also about uh, when we say things, we're talking about sounds, linguistic sounds. So, um, as you know, Arabic is a very old language, it's a Semitic language, it's a very old language. And it's an alive language. Some languages are not alive. Languages are like human beings. They get born, they become mature, they become old, and then they die. On Earth, there's about 6,000 to 7,000 languages. 50% of them are dead. And languages are dying at, at, a, at, a, at a high rate high speed. They say every two weeks or every one month, one language dies. And the language dies when the number of people speaking it are less than a thousand. It becomes an endangered species. Some languages are well and alive. Uh, Arabic is one of them. What makes a language healthy and that it could survive uh, is the language itself, the structure of the language, and also the linguistic sounds. Some languages in the world have only 11 sounds. And some have up to 60 sounds. Arabic is in the middle has around 32, 33 sounds. And with variants, imala and taqlil and so on, maybe 35 sounds. Uh, but unlike the other Semitic languages, uh, there are some sounds that are, are avoided in the Arabic language. They don't exist in the Arabic language. As the Syriac language might might have, or Hebrew, or other languages, or English. For example, in Arabic, we don't have O. The sound O, we don't have. We have the sound O. Our Dhamma is O, not O. We don't say Al Mu'min. We say al mu'min. It has to be dhamma, where you close completely. The sound o uh, might affect the sounds after it. And the sounds after it get compromised by the sound o. So you say, for example, uh, in English, just to illustrate the point, we, we say walk. We say talk. L gets swallowed. We don't say it anymore. We don't say walk or talk. Because this sound O or O affects the sound after it somehow. The sound O does not. And Syriac is a dying language. English is a dying language. According to David Crystal, one of the authorities on the English language, the English that we will speak in 50 years from now will be completely different from the English we have today. The English we speak today is completely different from the English that the British people spoke in the 17th or 16th century. There are some sounds that, uh, that have completely disappeared. Same thing with French. Same thing with other languages. 
the queen actually issued a decree at, in the 16th century or around that time banning certain sounds in the English language. She takes the word light, L-I-G-H-T. Um, I don't know how it was pronounced before, but G-H had a sound. It's Licht. Now, Licht is an ugly sound. It's not a nice sound. So the queen didn't like it. It got banned. And language has changed over the, over time. Uh, our youth are inventing, inventing idioms all the time. Before it was awesome. Now it's sick. Now it's lit. Now I don't know what will happen, ten years from now. Language is, the language is changing. And in fifty years to a hundred years, um, God knows what language would look like. But the Arabic language, uh, one of its features, that it's free from the sounds that, that the ulum have observed that languages die because of those sounds. Or it has to go a major change if those sounds are there. So if we go over dialect, there's a difference between dialect and language. When the dialect becomes so much and it develops its own grammar, it turns into a language. Uh, but there are three aspects of a dialect. Sometimes in one region versus another region, one tribe versus another tribe, one country versus another country, you might have different ways of pronouncing the same sounds. So different pronunciation, but the same meaning. Since we're talking about Arabic, and you can also have, think of examples in English or in French, or any other language. In Arabic, for example, let's take the word water. And to illustrate the point, let's take the, the way uh, Arabs uh, pronounce water today. So, in one region, maybe in the Arab world, you might hear the word ma in the Quran, ma. Another region might be ma. In a third region, it might be, it might be, Moya, like in Kuwait and some other places. In some region like uh, Lebanon and Syria and others or Egypt, they say Moy, and they make tafkhim of the meme, Moy, Moy. But different pronunciation, same meaning. The same meaning. So dialects might differ between tribes or between regions of people speaking the same language and they may say things differently but the meaning is the same. We're still talking about the same word and the same connotation. Sometimes the pronunciation is the same but the meaning is different between one region versus another. Like for example the word Galil. Galil. In Egypt, when you say Galil, Allahu Galla Galaluhu, Yani Jalil. Jalil. In Yemen or Saudi or other places, when you say Galil, it means Qalil, little. Dulab, the word Dulab, in some parts of the Arab world or Muslim world, it means uh, a tire, a rim. In some other parts, it means closet, like in Egypt, it means a closet. 
dolab. Same word, but different meanings depending on where you are, regions. Sometimes a word might exist in one region, but not in another. Like if you're driving and anybody from South Africa? If you're driving in South Africa, you see a sign, robot ahead. Robot ahead. When I think of the word robot, I think of transformers and artificial intelligence. But in South Africa, robot means traffic light. So they're telling you traffic light is ahead. So that's the word that's used in South Africa, but it's not used in California or in Canada or in the UK. Sometimes, um, uh, let's take Sakin versus Midia. Uh, Sayyiduna Abu Huraira uh, knows the word Midia in, in, in his tribe, uh, tribe of Banu Daus. They use the word Midia to indicate a knife. But in Medina and Mecca, they use the word sakin to indicate a knife. In the Quran, uh, in Surah Yusuf, uh, the wife of Al-Aziz in Egypt, she gave each lady a sakin. And then they, uh, they were so distracted, they, they cut their hand. They cut themselves. So one time, Abu Huraira was with the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet told him, Ya Abu Huraira, give me the sakin, give me the, the knife, a sakin. And Sayyidina Abu Huraira never heard this word, sakin. In his tribe, they call it Midya. And he looked around, and he couldn't find it. The Prophet asked him again. And he looked around, he couldn't find it. The Prophet asked him again. And then he said, And he pointed at it. And Abu Hayyar told him, Al Midya Taturid? Do you want Al Midya? Are you asking for Al Midya? He said, Yes, Abu Hayyar. Al Sikkin. Give me a Sikkin. So it's a word that's used in one tribe, but not in another. In one region, but not in another. Those are dialects. We call these dialects. When a dialect changes beyond this, it starts to become its own language. When so many words are different, uh, and then the structure changes, then you start seeing the birth of a new language. In many countries, you may have the language of the country and also some local languages here and there. So what turns a dialect into a language is when number three reaches a certain point and it becomes, it starts to become its own language. Okay. Let me ask you now another question. The Quran was revealed in what language? Was it revealed in the language of Banu Tamim or Ghatafan or Saqif or Azza Chanua or Quraysh or Banu Hanifa? Or which of the tribes the Quran was revealed in? Hmm? Do you say? Any guess? Hmm? Huh? Who says Quraysh? Let's take a vote. Who agrees with him? Hmm? Quraysh. Okay. So you agree with them? All right. All right. Okay. So are you saying Ausan Khazraj or Quraysh? Both. Okay. We have to. So we have a different answer. Who agrees with that guy? So we have Quraysh and we have Quraysh plus. Hmm? It's not Quraysh. Not Quraysh. Quran was revealed in Arabic. 
But the majority of the vocabulary in the Quran belongs to Quraysh. And a few words here and there were used from other tribes. Hmm? So, the vocabulary, Quraysh versus other tribes, like the word Qartas, for example, is not a Qurayshi word. The word Gharabib Usud, Gharabib, is not a Qurayshi word. It's not from the tribe of Quraysh. The word Maqalid Samawati Wal Ard, Maqalid. The word Halaka, perish. Halaka, i.e., dies. Uh, Quraysh doesn't say Halaka. They say Mata. He died. So some words, they're not from Quraysh. Quran was revealed in Arabic, encompassing all the Arab tribes. But the majority of the words, the vocabulary, Quraysh had the share of the lion. 99.9% .9 were, were Quraysh. And only a small percentage were from scattered words from various tribes because of uh, some connotations. So why Quraysh? Why Quraysh got the majority of the words? And here I've, the ulama have put some reasons. Quraysh actually, and Mecca, was the capital of the Arabs. What does that mean? It means Mecca was a center for people coming together. Like in New York, you have 800 nationalities in that city. It's a center for people coming together from all over Arabia and even the world at that time. Mecca was, and you have some, maybe some villages here and there, they're far away. They're locals. They have their own language, they have their own tribes. Mecca was different, Quraysh was different. And because you have this uh, melting pot of people, uh, the language is more refined and is more, uh, more mature. Not only that, the dialect of Quraysh became the standard for poetry and speeches. So the dialect of Quraysh became the global language. If you want to give a speech, you don't give it in your own dialect. You give it in the dialect of Quraysh. If you want to publish an article, now today you publish it in English. Don't publish it in French. Because English has become global language in business, for example. So the Meccan dialect became, became the global language for poetry. When the poets used to come to compete against each other, they would compose their poetry not using their own dialect, but using the Meccan dialect, the Qurayshi dialect, because it was the more, uh, it's a standard one. It became the standard one. And number three, when Sukhoi Kaz used to happen, Sukhoi Kaz is a yearly conference. Like today we have a yearly Hajj. Sukhoi Kaz is a yearly conference between uh, where people come and give speeches, when people come and, and present their products, when people come and consult. Zuhair ibn Abi Sulma used to work as a consultant. The, the junior, junior poets used to come to him and say, I've composed this, this poem, can you fix it for me? Can you review it for me? He became a consultant. So in the season of Sukh Iqaz and Hajj, the season of Hajj, even before Islam, when people used to come and visit the Kaaba, visit Mecca, uh, Quraysh dialect became the standard and was the one that was used, not their own dialect. And because the Quraysh dialect is, is uh, very refined, the majority of the vocab in the Quran belong to Quraysh with only a few words here and there because of connotation, because of original meanings that were kept, and they add 
shade of meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used them in the Quran. Right. So, uh, there are things, more things to say, but let's uh, keep that discussion for another time, inshallah. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, we can do another one on the oral transmission of the Qur'an. Let's go back now to the time of Sayyidina Osman. And what he witnessed was this. He witnessed someone reading, وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ And someone else reading, وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلْبَيْتِ Not لِلَّهِ in Surah Al-Baqarah. The meaning is not far off, but that shouldn't happen. So he left Armenia and Azerbaijan and went straight to Medina to tell Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Osman, that uh, do something about uh, this problem, something a problem that can start small may become something very large. And as soon as he saw the beginning of, of people differing, maybe someone didn't memorize the verse properly, maybe whatever, maybe he wrote it wrong, he was alarmed and went straight to Sayyidina Osman to tell him to do something. So Sayyidina Osman put a committee together. Now imagine yourself, you know, in the presence of Sayyidina Osman, and all of a sudden you see this guy coming from Armenia and Azerbaijan, and he's alarmed and telling Sayyidina Osman, do something about the Ummah before they differ. What would you do if you were Sayyidina Osman? What would you do? You tell him, hey, calm down. What happened? Like, tell me what's wrong. Why are you so, uh, so upset? Then Sayyidina Huzaifa radiallahu anhu related to Sayyidina Osman what took place. And Sayyidina Osman consulted with the people and they came to the conclusion that we should do something about it. So what Sayyidina Osman did, he put a committee together. He put another team. And he chose Zayd again. And he put a committee with Zayd. They started out uh, as four. And by the time the project ended, they became 12 people working on the project. Some of those guys, uh, Sayyidina Osman put a committee together, Zaid and people helping him. Uh, the project took five years to execute. Lots of reviews and reviews and reviews and reviews. And some of those people were chosen. We will talk about some of them. And several master copies were made. So the outcome of this project is that several master copies were made. Exact copies of the original. And each copy was sent to uh, the urban area or the capital of provinces. And with each master copy, a master reciter was also sent. So let's talk about uh, this committee again. Committee and plan. Again, we have to ask the same questions. 
what is the motivation, what is the consultation process, how was the project approved, and decision uh, and selection of the committee. And the 12 people that were selected, they were from the Muhajirin and Ansar. And the qualifications of the people, of the committee members, so we had Saeed ibn al -As. He was fasih, he was eloquent. Well, if you were to hear him, each letter, uh, when he pronounces a word, it's like each letter is coming on its own. Very fasih. Zaid is experienced. Ubay is the top-notch qari. Uh, and then other, Abdullah ibn Abbas was chosen as well. And Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Abbas read the Quran under Zaid ibn Sabit uh, about five times. He completed four times, and he read most of the fifth. So, people who are experts, people who are qualified, people who have experience. Abdullah bin Abbas, as you know, is Mufassir by excellence. He is a top Mufassir among the companions, one of the top Mufassirs. And he read Tafsir under Sayyidina Ali. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas. And the committee worked day and night for five years to produce up to seven copies that were sent to the Amsar, to the urban areas of the Muslim world. Wherever there is a large concentration of, uh, of people, a master copy and a master reciter was sent. Not just a master copy, because at the end, we want to make sure that we recite properly. So we have documentation control, we have recitation control. So today, for example, if somebody gives you an ijaza, if a top-notch scholar gives you an ijaza in Tajweed, uh, I'm not talking about the various uh, people that know Qira'at who are still junior or intermediate or they're still young. But the top-notch ulama in the Muslim world today, when he gives you an ijaza, he is telling you, you are now carbon copy of me. And I am a carbon copy of my sheikh. Back to the Prophet wasallam. Uh, many Qur'an who read today, they're not at that expertise yet, even if they have 10 Qur'an or 7 Qur'an or another. Uh, but there are top-notch ulama in the Muslim world that are experts on uh, uh, Qur'an and Tajweed and Qur'an that fit this criteria. in the committee. So, <clears throat> what was the role of the committee members? Uh, the committee members had various roles. Some of them were uh, dictating, reciting. Some of them were writing. Some of them were reviewing. And various, the processes became known to them. And the statement of work, the, the mission to them was that you, you copy and uh, you know that Quraysh has the absolute majority of vocab and their dialect is a standard. And that's how they worked. 
Today, for example, when uh, uh, when we have copies of the Quran, when we enjoy copies of the Quran in our mosque, there's a huge effort that went behind producing a copy that is free of error. In many parts of the Muslim world, be it in Damascus or in Cairo, or now in Saudi, they have complexes for producing Qurans, or elsewhere in the Muslim world, in India and in Pakistan, many areas, when, when a calligrapher is tasked with writing the Quran, there are committees. And there are people that when someone is writing, there are people that are watching him as he writes. He's writing each letter, each word. And people watching, and some people that uh, because they've been doing this for 50 years, 60 years, if you were to ask one of them, if you were to say one word, he would tell you which surah it is, which page it is, which line it is, which number of words in that line it is. They know all words. And the Quran, that's, the Mus'haf, that's the copy of the Quran that's produced today, it's either 15 lines per page or 13 lines per page. That's the standard today. So if you have 15 lines, that's about 600 pages. If you have 13 lines, that's a bit more. And then review and review and review and review and review until um, the hundreds of editions or versions that you see, they're all the same. They're all the same. So this committee worked day and night to produce five to seven master copies that were sent to the various areas. And Sayyidina Arasman kept a copy with him as well. And when he, when he was killed, when he was martyred, he was reading that master copy. So in Medina, there were two copies, two master copies. One was Sayyidina Osman, and one was a reference for everybody else. So continuous review, and until the final review takes place, until it's ready for, for, for it to be published, and then Sayyidina Asman would send it with a master reciter. So some was sent to Mecca, some was sent to Yemen, some was sent, master copy was sent to Damascus, to Kufa, to Bahrain. Bahrain in the old days is not like Bahrain today. Bahrain today is an island. Bahrain in the old days, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu it's a whole eastern shore which includes Bahrain and Qatar and Dammam and Khubar and Zahran and all that area used to be called Bahrain. Today, the, uh, Bahrain indicates the name of a country, not a region. And in Medina, Sayyidina Osman kept two copies. One copy with the people and one copy with himself. One copy in the... Uh, in the mosque of the Prophet with the reciter and Abu Abdurrahman al-Sulami was sent to Kufa and that's where Al-Hasan al Hussein read under him and then copies and Sayyidina Osman told the people now when you want to make copies, you make copies from those master copies. Whatever, and he says, whatever you have in your hand, if it agrees with the master copies, you can keep. If it doesn't agree, destroy. Don't keep. So many of those uh, copies that may be copied from originals or copies from copies from copies from copies from originals, uh, most of them got destroyed or burned. However, we also know 
that Sayyidina Osman buried some copies in Medina. Some copies that uh, uh, any copy that doesn't agree with the master copy, they were either burnt or destroyed or buried. Uh, Saudi Arabia today doesn't do archaeological work. Uh, they are not um, active in that regard. But it may happen that 100 years from now or 50 years from now, some might do, might dig something in Medina and find one of those copies that might be different than the master copy that we have today. The master copy that we have today is authenticated and being transmitted by mass transmission by Tawator. It is the reference. Today, if we print any other Mus'haf, we compare it to the master copy that's been transmitted to us. We authenticate, if you bring me a Mus'haf today, bring me a copy of the Quran, and this copy of the Quran that you have, I authenticate it based on the master copy and the reference. If I find a new manuscript anywhere like from 200 years, that manuscript is not authentic to me unless it agrees with whatever was transmitted. So we can authenticate manuscripts based on what we know. But that's a certainty. This is Yaqeen. If somebody wrote a Mus'haf maybe a hundred years ago on his own, he might have made a mistake. It's no, there is no guarantee that you might not have made a mistake. But the ulama have developed a process uh, and documented the words of the Quran in volumes and volumes in case, let's say, all the copies of the Quran today were to be destroyed or disappear from the face of the earth. An earthquake hits the earth and all of them disappears. Uh, the ulama have written other books that will allow us to reproduce the Quran accurately 100% without even having any copy. And those books are called Rasmul Masahif, how to write the Mus'haf, how to write the Quran. It's a sign, it became a discipline on its own. And each uh, uh, book in that uh, discipline could be seven volumes, ten volumes, and talks about each and every word in the Quran and how to write it, how to make calligraphy of it. It's a discipline that ulama of Quran uh, have to go through, ulama of Qira'at have to go through. Tajweed is just the art of recitation, but Qira'at is the art of, uh, it's another art. It's the art of uh, also writing the Quran, reproducing the Quran, how to write each and every letter. There are five categories of words that were documented. Arabic, as we mentioned, is, is a language that uh, is WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. Hmm? So when you hear a word, uh, you can write it down because the sound that you produce, the linguistic sound, is exactly the letters in 99% of cases. Unlike English or French where you say monsieur, monsieur, you, the way you write it is M-O-N-S-I-E-U-R. Completely different from how you pronounce it. Same thing with English, midnight or light. You write it differently than the way you pronounce it. But in Arabic, what you pronounce, you can write it exactly the same, except for five categories of words that were documented. Were documented in, in volumes and volumes, from all angles, so that uh, it can always be reproduced in the hypothetical event of copies of the Quran, uh, not being available anymore. So it's another 
another double checking. So what is the impact of the solution and what does the solution solve and what is it that is not supposed to solve? So Huzaifa ibn al-Yaman, what was his reaction? He left uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan immediately. As soon as he witnessed that, he, he for him it was like booga booga. This is not supposed to happen. So what problem did Sayyiduna Osman solve? What problem did Sayyiduna Osman solve? His solution? Did it because the question we will have to ask is okay. Let's forget this for now. Okay. Sayyiduna Hazaifa came to Sayyiduna Osman and told him there's a problem. And Sayyiduna Osman consulted the companions and agreed on a solution and they said this is a solution we're going to adopt the question is is the solution adequate so after the solution was implemented and the project was completed did it fulfill its mission did it the requirements were they met or not hmm? i.e was Sayyidina Huzaifa satisfied that this solution has actually solved the problem he saw, or not? What was the reaction of the companions and Sayyidina Huzaifa and others toward that, uh, that proposed solution? They've all agreed that this is a solution. And after that, we don't hear of any other complaint from any other companions anywhere in the world. So what did the solution solve? It solved three things. The first thing it solved is that the order of words. So for example, when I read uh, the Quran, I do not switch to words. I read one word before another. For example, وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ or وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْحَقِّ بالموت. I don't make switch. I keep the order of the words. The order now is protected. The second uh, point the solution solved is uh, synonymous or replacement. Hmm? If someone by mistake, when they copy, they put another word instead of a word, that's now been, uh, it can easily be discovered and it can easily be corrected. Hmm? Like what? Jazakumullah khairan. An example is synonymous or replacement, like when uh, instead of a word, say, uh, Hypothetically, Akbar, you say Azam. Hmm? Uh, that would be synonymous. So instead of writing Akbar, you wrote Azam by mistake. Even though it's a synonymous, not accepted. It has to be the exact word. Hmm? And that's part of our, our uh, Islamic disciplines. Like in the Quran, it says, Yatlu alayhim ayatihi. Recite the verses as is, not recite the meanings, not recite synonymous, as is. And the same thing in our life, as is. When we quote other people, we quote them as is. When people say something, we quote them accurately. We don't put words in their mouth, as is, because we have to be responsible. And that became uh, one of the layer of scholarship. It's called naklun wariwaya. When you quote people, you quote them accurately. When you transmit from people, you transmit accurately. When you say people said this because of this, and this is their evidence, you make sure that you're bringing the exact evidence that they said, 
not an evidence that you found in one book or another book. No, it has to go back to them. And that became a layer of scholarship. And today, this layer is messed up with many people. So before they become top-notch scholars, that layer has to be mastered. Now I'm saying it. Hold on. Yes. They're all mutawatir. There are 10 ways of Qiraat. They're all mutawatir. They're not about this. We're going to talk about them, inshallah, later. But the oral format, we said we're not going to talk about it now because it requires another, another talk, inshallah. But Jazakumullah khairan for raising the point. The third uh, potential or uh, problem that it solved, it's addition, insertion, or omission of words. Let's say I'm writing the Quran, I'm writing a copy of the Quran, and I forget to write one word. Or I write, I put another word. Either because I want to, I put the meaning of a word, or I insert a word, I omit a word, I add a word. All of this now uh, is no longer possible because we have a master copy that we can always double check. So this is what the problem solved. However, the solution that Sayyidina Asman proposed must not exclude the mutawatir sounds, the linguistic sounds that the Prophet ﷺ transmitted to us by tawatir. And this is one of your questions. Is we say, for example, Maliki Yawmiddin. Maliki Yawmiddin. The script allows for both. So the solution has to exclude a problem, but not cause another problem. It has to make sure that the Qur'an are still can be read by that same script, by that same writing. So for example, the word Malik can be read as Malik or Malik. Yakhda'un can be read as Yukhadi'un or Yakhda'un, because the Arabs, at the time, they don't write the alif on words. Yakzibun, yukazibun, allows for both. Khatam, khatim, the fatha or the kasra, the script would allow for both. And all of those are linguistic sound that Prophet Sallam taught to, to uh, the early Muslims, and the early Muslims taught the students and the students taught the students up until today. So the solution that Sayyidina Asman came up with addressed the issue and also made sure that the linguistic sounds can still be transmitted, the mutawatir sounds from the Prophet can be transmitted and preserved in the same script. Uh, so now we have to ask ourselves a question. All right, is this the end? Now we can go home and relax and sleep? No, it's not the end. It's the beginning. So now, we're, let's say we're at Sayyidina Osman's time. Now we have to make sure that from Sayyidina Osman up until today, in each and every generation, the Qur'an is always reproduced accurately. The Mus'haf is reproduced accurately. The way the Arabs used to... Uh, can I use the board for some... For you? Okay. Can you all see it? I'll write something. So I'm sure most of you, can you all see from over there? I'm sure most of you know the alphabet. So in the, today we have ba, 
and the and the to be the and the. But at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu those three letters were written like this. There were no dots. There was Jim and Ha and Kha. At the time of the Prophet, they were written like this. One symbol, one, uh, one form representing letters. The letter Fa and Qaf was written like this. No, no dot. It was like that. And the Arabs knew how to read. But as new Muslims, as people became Muslims, and new Muslims started to read the Quran, it was very difficult. So now we have to make sure that we can distinguish between the letters. And Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali and his students took on that process. So this process is called i'jam of the letters. The consonants, the consonant letter, there we need a way to distinguish each letter from another letter. Each letter needs to have its own form. The letter Saad, Dad, Ta, and Za used to be written like this. All these four letters used to be written as one symbol. So what did they do? They added something here, and they added something here. to distinguish these two letters from these two letters. Now we need to distinguish this letter from this letter. So they added a dot here to distinguish dot from saw. And what they did, they put a line here to distinguish these two from these two. And to distinguish this guy from this guy, they added a dot here. So the, the one symbol became four symbols to represent four letters. Because each letter must have its own symbol. So that process took place. Like Ra and Zay used to be written like this. But now to distinguish Z from R, we put a dot on the Z. In Tajweed, you have to pronounce each letter properly, yes. yes. But in the, the way it was written, it was written like this. You see this uh, on the screen? There were no dots. There were no fatha, no dhamma, no kasras. And the Arabs, they know how to read. Even today, I don't need fatha, and dhamma, and kasra. I can read without them. But if someone is new, they need fatha, dhamma, kasra. Someone They and ta, they're different letters, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not learning here, no. Yeah. Because some letters, some letters, like the letter ta that, that you talked about, and the letter ta, uh, in the science of Tajweed or Ilm al Aswat, the science of sound, some letters. Uh, so when I pronounce a letter, when I pronounce a letter, I open my mouth. I have air in my lungs. The air in my lungs has to come out. Has to come out. So I say, ta, ta, it goes out. I say, ta. 
when it goes out, it doesn't go out like this. So with ta, what I need to do, I need to create an echo in the letter before it goes out. As an echo is created, the letter becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. In the letter ta, the air in my lungs goes straight out. In the letter ta, the air in my lungs are pushed to the roof, the roof of my, my mouth, the roof of my palate. So it hits the roof, then it reflects, and then reflects, and then reflects, and then reflects, creates an echo, and then it goes out. When this echo is created, it's called tafkhim, or isti'la. When I say the letter wa, I'm pushing the air out. Push the air out. It does its own creation of echo, and then it goes out from my mouth. But with other letters, I say ta, a, ba. The air of my, in my lungs goes and goes out without any echo. If I create an echo, that's the wrong sound for the ba and ta. But that's part of tashweed. When to create an echo, when not to create an echo. And what is the process, the mechanism of creating an echo? That's something uh, we study in Tajweed or in, in Ilm al Aswat, the discipline of sound. Now, Jazakumullah khairan for, for these uh, observations and questions. So, here we have a situation. So, is this the end? No, this is not the end. Now, we need to have documentation control. Make sure every time we write a mushaf, it has to be written according to the same rules and principles of the master copy. And secondly, we have to do recitation control. Like our dear uh, brother and elder has mentioned. How to recite it properly, like the Prophet So, And also, uh, we need to help new Muslims, or people who don't know how to read Arabic without dots, or without Fatha and Dhamma and Kasra. So, the correctness of the reading, we have to make sure that the consonants uh, are, uh, can be distinguished even though they may have similar forms. The Ra and the Zay have similar forms, but we distinguish them by, by a dot. And we need the phonetic guide, the rules of Tajweed. So, the ulama immediately, as soon as they saw some lahan, some uh, deviation in the recitation, they put uh, the whatever they heard from the companions in book format. That's how you pronounce ta, that's how you pronounce ba, that's how you pronounce this, that's how you pronounce combination of letters, that's how you pronounce, that's how you make an echo, that's how you make ghunna. Hmm? When you make ghunna, you push the air through your nose that even possible so so we so they started doing something called what we call today orthography or resum so the ba the ta and the sa used to have the same form the jim the ha and the kha used to have the same form the dal and the zal used to have the same form the fa and the qaf used to have the same form the seen as the sheen, the sod, the dod, the ta, the za, used to have the same form. The ain and the rain used to have the same form. And some letters, they had their own form because there is no other letter that resembles them that could cause uh, confusion. And then came the vowels. The vowels is fatha, dhamma, and kasra. In fatha, fatha means to open. What are we opening? We're opening the jaw. 
and we're opening the jaw vertically, vertically. Kasra means we're opening the jaw as khafad. We're opening the jaw horizontally, not vertically. And dhamma means we are closing completely, uh, and dhamma comes from gathering together, closing completely. It's an ooh sound. So the fatha is an ah sound. When you say ah, you open vertically. Cat, mat, fat. But that's an A sound in English. If you speak English, you can do Tajweed. There is, I have no doubt. Because most of the linguistic sounds uh, exist in Arabic in, as well as in English. But sometimes, because we come from an English background, we think we start reading Arabic in a weird way, thinking this is Tajweed. But there are tricks that can help you uh, learn Tajweed in a natural way. Let's put it this way. The Dhamma is an oo sound, like blue, like moon, like moo, like the cow, when the cow makes a sound. Moo, blue. The E, the Kasra is an E sound. E, you open horizontally. Like B, when you have the B buzzing, B, E, me, me too, me, the same sound. If you speak English, you can do Tajweed. All right. So in English, for example, if you are a native English, you'll be able to read this. Can you read it? Yeah, you may struggle with it a little bit, but with some practice, it becomes second nature. The same thing in Arabic. You can also read this in Arabic, even though the dots are omitted. And the Arabs used to do it naturally. For us, we have to go through training to do it properly. In the first half of the century, the master copies only included the form of the letters, the body of the letter. In Arabic, it's called the resum of the letters only. No dots, no fatha, dhamma, kasra, no uh, names of surahs, no numbers. No numbers of pages, just the body of the Quran, of the text. In the first centuries, the vowels were added, Fatha, Dhamma, and Kasra, to help a new Muslim read. If uh, you need to open your mouth, they put a line above. If you need to close your mouth, they put a small wow. If you need to lower your jaw and open your uh, mouth horizontally, uh, they put a strike underneath the letter in the second century. In the first century, they put dots. But dots became confusing, so they make it like a line, a small line. And then they made pointing diac diacritics, which is the ajam to differentiate and distinguish consonants from one another. And in the third centuries, until the 15th centuries, it was beautifying the, uh, the font, making different fonts. Like in English, you have Arial and Helvetica and all these things. In Arabic, you have Kufi, you have Nasr, you have Sulus have the various fonts and calligraphers uh, calligraphy became an art became a discipline became a science that people study and and learn okay. now the okay. 
the next issue is now if uh, hypothetically we want to always reproduce the mushaf as was written at the time of Uthman when the master copies were produced so the ulama looked at all the words in the Quran and documented five categories of words and that became a new discipline called Ilm Rasmi Al-Masahif and books and books and books and books and books and books are written from all angles so discipline of Rasmi Al-Masahif became uh, its own science and was developed as highlights um, uh, this afternoon we that's almost on time alhamdulillah this afternoon we went very briefly over this this is a course actually that uh, uh, ulama study over one year uh, from all angles and and sometimes rasm al-musahif takes longer uh, but part of this usually is covered in 12 sessions or 24 sessions and today we were very quickly we went to a summary highlights in order to uh, give ourselves uh, an appreciation of the effort like without their effort we would be lost today we would not be able to read the quran we would not be able to we don't know what to do uh, uh, languages keep on changing all the time keeps on changing sounds keep on changing but in our case we what we see and what we recite is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ recited is exactly what the companions recited is exactly what the early Muslims and Muslims over the ages recited because even the art how to make a sound was transmitted how to make a sound for each letter in in all states whether it's in the state of fatha or dhamma on kasra it was transmitted and it's transmitted with with rigor like you're not gonna finish bismillah rahman rahim properly until you read it properly it may take six weeks it may take six months you have to read it properly only then you'll be qualified to be uh, a top-notch alim. We also uh, we are very fortunate that uh, the copies of the Quran can be reproduced 100%. This is something that uh, 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 I, I was listening to biblical scholars and other religions uh, they would love to have these issues they would love to have a master copy they would love to have you know the challenge of uh, reproducing accurately something that was uh, originally authenticated and we are very fortunate that uh, uh, that we are uh, we are like this. Uh, it can be reproduced 100% accurately in all circles. It's not just in Cairo. Or it's not just in Damascus. It's not just in Saudi. No, also in Malaysia and in Indonesia, everywhere. In all circles of the Muslim world, even in North America, it can be reproduced. Once you study Ilm Rasm al Masahif, it can be done. It's training, it can be done. And the disciplines of Rasm al Masahif and Qiraat uh, was developed. Qiraat became, uh, like today we, we have, if you study digital communications or digital transmission of information, you have coding and error correction codes Qiraat became a code. Uh, the ulama wrote poems that if you read it, it's a shifra, it's a code. You have to, to decipher it. 
because they're able to condense a lot of information into poems that you can recite as, as a song. Difficult disciplines became a song, and once you practice the song and sing it, now you know, you know everything about a particular discipline, be it tajweed or qiraat and so on and so forth. And authentication of manuscripts, that I find the manuscript here, I find the manuscript there, the manuscript that I find is not the, is not the reference. I'm going to associate what I find based on what I know. Because what I know is 100% certain. What I find needs to be authenticated, not vice versa. So if a manuscript is found in Birmingham or in Sana'a or on Mars or on the moon, that manuscript, I don't know its origin. It needs to be authenticated, not vice versa. And that's the message I hope that we, we all get, inshallah. طيب, we'll stop here. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. جزاكم الله خيرا. Thank you very much for, for staying and listening uh, for two and a half hours, three hours. جزاكم الله خيرا. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد.